Steven, what's going on, man? What's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, great, great. Excited to have you on the show. Hope you are enjoying spring training. How how has that been for you uh, this off season? How has it been? And now spring training. Uh, are you enjoying yourself out there? Yeah, man, I'm having a great time. I mean, it's a great organization. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of stressful at first just trying to get to know everybody. Uh, but once, you know, everybody's been great. And so it made the transition, you know, pretty easy. And the off season was good. Uh, I had a good off season. And, uh, you know, I'm just ready to get going. Absolutely. Ready to get going. It's great to hear for the Red Sox. They've kind of switched their whole clubhouse around, signing a lot of free agents, switching out of that toxic clubhouse that was described last year. John Farrell, there's already with some connections there. He's the manager, was a scouting director for the Indians when they picked you uh, in, in that 2006 draft. Now, I want to get to that so we get some background knowledge on you before we get uh, to, to where you are right now, which it is a journey. It's a, it's an un. Uh, usual journey, to say the least, and, and not every player uh, becomes a knuckleball. And that's what a lot of people are talking right now with the Tim Wakefield. And, uh, you know, you, you've had the knuckleball for, you know, a year and a half or so, but right now you're, you're kind of on the brink of making some history with the Red Sox. Uh, but let's go back to that draft. You're at the University of Hawaii. You're drafted out of the second round uh, by the Indians. Before that draft, you had an 11-2 record, excuse me. You have a repertoire of uh, fastball, curveball, cutter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and you were a good pitcher throughout the minor league. So, uh, I mean, was that draft, though, looking back at it, the most exciting experience that you have had in baseball? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely, you know, a, a high focal point for me at the time. Um, I really didn't get to enjoy the draft as much as everybody else had because I had mono at the time. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, I was I was sleeping, you know, when my name was called, and I kind of woke up, gave it a, yeah, and then went right back to sleep, you know. Wow. So, I mean, it was kind of sucks. But once, yeah, it, it, but once, you know, everything kind of got going as far as, you know, I started getting healthier and, uh, you know, getting over the mono, man. I mean, it was a blast. I mean, I, it, was, it was definitely, uh, you know, it's the start of everybody's dream that, you know, that wants to play baseball, and that's the start of your dream is, you know, getting to the big leagues. Absolutely, it really is, and you're getting past this draft. Though once you get over the the, the mono, of course, and uh, you know playing with the Indians in that organization, you were kind of stuck in between this low A, single A, double A, triple A, back to double A uh, for for about five years. You played in the minor leagues. You're not a bad pitcher at all. You you look at the numbers, they're fine. I mean, it was an average minor leaguer. Um, you know, obviously the velocity stood out. You had a lot of promise. Second round pick. Um, can you kind of sum up your overall experience in the minor leagues? Was it hard to adjust that grind that that players talk about? You know, is that over exaggerated? How difficult was was that for you? So, I mean, if you can, if there's a way to kind of sum up uh, those few years that you spent in the minor leagues. Um, I mean, I didn't think it was that hard. Cause, you know, going from college, I think college really prepared myself. Um, I would say that you know, early on, I didn't wasn't able to really establish a routine, so I was you know, kind of just go out there and do whatever and then took you know after the first couple of years I started getting a routine and you know I felt like you know in 2009 I did well and then in 2008 I did pretty good um and, you know I just kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit you know I mean there's just so many right handers out there uh that throw you know low to mid 90s with a slider and it was just kind of you know who to, who are they going to pick up and so it got a little frustrating and then, you know, going into 2010, that's when I got a little frustrated when I got sent back down to, to double it. And it's just like, man, it's like, is this what I'm going to be, a career minor leaguer? And then the knuckleball kind of, you know, changed that whole feat. Yeah, you talked about it. The knuckleball has changed it. You talked 2010. At that point, you're in the Indians organization. You talked uh, kind of the turning point, which seems to be from AAA back to AA. Um, when did you start throwing the knuckleball? Uh, you know, I've heard, I've read some things that, you know, you kind of always had that pitch around, but you never really, uh, you started throwing it, and maybe some coaches were impressed, and they saw, you know, a potential there. Uh, who were the first knuckleballers that you started throwing with? Well, uh, you know, when did you really learn about the knuckleball, how to use it, uh, and how much have you progressed? How has that, you know, how has that progressed as a pitch from back in 2010 all the way up to now? Well, when I first started throwing it, it was an out pitch. It was basically I was throwing it as hard as I can, uh, not worry too much about killing the spin and all that. And in 2011, I was trying to throw it slow, but I had worked at camp with Candy Audi a little bit, and he just kind of reassured that I had a good knuckleball. And so, you know, just from that point on, that's when I just started concentrating on, you know, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then after that season, I kind of just almost gave up on it. I was like, you know what? I was like, this is not – I don't want to do this because 
I couldn't repeat it because I was trying to throw it like in the 60s. Uh-huh. And then so when I went to Panama, that's when I started throwing it a little bit harder because I was throwing it off my fastball. And that's when I started getting in. When I went to Charlie Huff, I went over to the Dodgers facility, worked with him, and it was like a nine day difference. He just helped me simplify it. It's like, you know, you got to, it's just like, you know, a regular pitcher. You got to have your checkpoints and you got to, you got to be able to, you know, repeat your delivery and whatever the velocity is, that's what it is. Uh, you can't get caught up in the velocity. You got to just concentrate more on killing the spin of the ball and keeping it in the zone. And then that's, that was the turning point as far as like my, you know, it's like now I had something to build off of instead of just kind of going out there and just trying to kill the spin, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so it, it definitely has progressed from there. I think I read something about you decided to take the curveball out of the repertoire so you can kind of build off that with the fastball going uh, at it. With the velocity thing, though, that's that's kind of the big thing that people talk about. I'm sure you probably are getting sick of the comparisons to Ari Dickey by now. Uh, and people always kind of saying, oh, where was he at this point? Where was he at this point? Um, because Tim Wakefield is kind of a whole nother, uh, a whole nother nature right there. His velocity, it's much lower than yours. And he didn't have a fastball of it a low 90s he had a fastball of you know 68 70 miles per hour so you know a completely different situation but you will be uh you know getting to work with him more this week uh, I, I believe throughout spring training so that should help though um you know when you're in this indians organization in 2011 um and, and they're really starting to develop you with this knuckleball did you ever have any thoughts in your mind that you know, they were going to trade you? Did you see they want to develop you into a starter? Were you just kind of uh, doing the best you can for that day, not really thinking ahead? Um, and how did that deal come about, you know, with the trade deadline getting sent to uh, Boston for Lars Anderson? Did you hear any rumors? Were you expecting it? And, and how did you actually hear about the deal? Uh, I had no idea that I was going to get traded. I didn't know that I was even thought of at the time. I honestly didn't even think anybody was really paying attention to another knuckleballer. You know, I kind of, you know, I was still in double A and I knew I had been doing well, you know, I've been feeling good, but I was, you know, it was basically like I counted as my first year of doing it because I was throwing a harder knuckleball. So, you know, the previous year was just what not to do. And so like last year was kind of my first year really saying like, okay, this is what I'm going to do from here on out. I'm going to throw what, you know, people say the harder knuckleball, and I'm going to build off of this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, you know, the trade cap, and I, we were actually in Portland playing uh, Boston's double-A team, and I was throwing a bullpen, and I just got done throwing a pin, and uh, Tony Arnold, the pitching coach, his phone rang, and it was Trammy, the manager, and he's like, you know, talking to him, and he turned to me, he goes, you need to go see Trammy. And I was just like, uh, well, you know, I was kind of like, hey, can I get my work in? He goes, no, nah, I think you need to go see him. And then you can figure it out after that. But he never said anything. He didn't say what was going on. So I kind yeah. of, I started thinking like, all right, well, maybe they're calling me up to, to AAA. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, all right. So I grabbed my stuff. I ran in and I was and I go straight to Trammy. And I was like, you know, hey, TA wanted me to, uh, to talk to you. And he goes, yeah, sit down. So I'm thinking, like, great, I'm getting released. Or, you know, you know, the yeah. time when they start to say, hey, sit down, it's like, oh, gosh. Oh, like, yeah. what's going, you know? And he goes, you know, uh, Cleveland has made a, a trade, and you've been traded to the Boston Red Sox for Lars Anderson. And I was just, like, blown away. I was like, really? I was like, because, I mean, if you think about it, if, you have, if you're a knuckleballer and you, you know, had to pick a team – why wouldn't you pick the Red Sox? But so yeah. maybe the Mets at the time, like last year at that time, because of what RA was doing. Mm-hmm. But ideally, it's the Red Sox. I mean, because of the history with Wakefield, it's like, why not? Like, okay, the Mets had Dickey for a couple years. But in the end, like, the Red Sox had Wakefield for, what, 8, 16, 17 years? Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, so 200 wins. And so it's like, you know, I was just, like, blown away. I was kind of – I was kind of, like, excited and, and a little sad just because I had been with the Indians for so long, so I knew that I was leaving a great group of guys, great staff and everything, but I knew that I was like, you know, this is this is a great, you know, new chapter in my life. And so I just packed up my bags and walked across the field of the Portland Clubhouse. <laughs> that, that's funny, just walking across the field. It's funny because, you know, you got to start in double A. 
You did very well. They put you in Triple A, and you finish off last season on on kind of a high streak there with a you know a lot of solid starts. You know, trying to keep the walks down. You're really pr- very promising. So you kind of got you on the Red Sox radar. Part of it, another reason, is the staff. The starting rotation has had some issues of late with injuries, uh, and there could very well be an opportunity for you to fit in in the future. Not sure about this year. Uh, we'll see about with injuries and such. But in the future, being on the front line part of that staff as a knuckleballer, you talked about the history of the. Red Sox. Uh, it's really interesting. Now, so far, I want to. I'm wondering how has the organization treated you? Um, you know, going out into spring training, how how have the teammates, the coaches, how how has everything in Boston been? Has it been everything you you thought it would be? Any major surprises for you? You know, how has Boston been? It's been better. Than, it's better than what I ever thought it would be. I mean, they treat me. You know, like, they treat everybody the same. You know, they don't treat me different just because I'm a knuckleballer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, except for sometimes some guys will stick around just to watch, just to see, you know, the, the, just to see the knuckleball. But I would say, I mean, it's been great. I mean, they, you know, I haven't felt any different. Uh, I was a little, you know, thinking that I was going to be treated a little different, not so much with the staff, but with kind of the guys, just because, oh, hey, he, you know, he's just a knuckleballer, then, you know, they kind of, but push him to the side because, you know, all he does is go up there and throw a batting practice and, you know, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I was a little, you know, skeptical on how, I, you know, the guys were going to kind of accept a, a new knuckleballer. But, I mean, the, this group of guys, I mean, the clubhouse is, is, is fun. I mean, I enjoy waking up every day and getting in there, working with the staff. You know, they they definitely do everything and they're, you know, and they're what they're capable of doing to help you become successful what it's not just speaking for myself but for the other guys i mean they will literally do whatever they can whether it's in the training room uh the weight room i mean video i mean they literally have everything you can think of that Mm -hmm. make you you know become you know able to to compete day in and day out i mean mean, i'm blown away with with the stuff that they have Mm-hmm. Um, and the you know the stuff that we have that we are you know have to at our access, it's just it's it's unbelievable. Like words can't like I couldn't explain. It's so hard to explain because of the fact that it's it's more than I ever thought could be possible. I mean they literally have thought of pretty much everything. Wow. And so you know which is it's comforting because you know that no matter what they got pretty much an answer for everything. And if they mm-hmm. don't, I mean they'll get one you know within the day. Yeah. It's crazy. It works very fast. You're out on the east, big market team, a lot of resources, the faculty, you know, the facilities, uh, a big part in that. And that, that's part of success. Yeah, you have to have the facilities. You got to have the coaching staff. Uh, you have to have the work ethic and all of that is there. So I uh, expect a bright future for Boston this year uh, and getting better and better throughout the next few years. They've had a, a bit of a struggle the last few years. They had the, the toxic clubhouses as described, um, but they're getting through that. I think they, they got the right free agents to get the job done. A lot of great teammates that you'll probably be working with uh, very soon. Guys like Shane Victorino, you know, Stephen Drew, Mike Napoli, uh, clubhouse guys, Johnny, you know, Johnny Gomes, uh, Ryan Dempster. I mean, the list goes on and on with a veteran, uh, you know, who knows they know how to win. And I think that they're uh, the right guys to get the job done. Now, getting to the comparisons of Ari Dickey that I'm sure you deal with on a day-to-day basis, uh, because there just aren't that many knuckleballers that stand out and you're getting you're starting to stand out uh because of the recent attention with uh getting help from tim wakefield 